So welcome to our seventh lecture and thank you for joining us again in this series. As usual, before we start with this lecture, there are some technical things to keep in mind. The presentation will go for 60 minutes, followed by a 30 minute discussion. Please turn off your camera and microphone during the presentation. If you have a question, please post it in the chat and we will get to it during the discussion. You can write your message in the chat in English or in German. If you have a question and want to ask it by yourself, you can put a star in the chat and I will call you during the discussion. If you want to follow this lecture in German, there's a translation available for you. Just click on the bottom of uh, on Dolmetschen and join the German channel. And at this point, thank you, uh, Julia, for your translation work today. Okay, let's get to our speaker. Today's speaker is the sixth in our series and also the third person from Canada. And um, But before introducing him, I, want to, I would like to point out some things about our lecture series. When we from Students of Future Hildesheim started planning it, we decided on two categories of talks. Number one is a scientific lecture with a focus on numbers, research, and facts. Number two is a lecture that focuses on the viewpoint of an activist. Our today's guest unites these two categories. He is not only a scientist, but also a teacher and an activist. After completing his master's in science in environmental science at University of Guelph, Curtis Baudy went on build to build a science YouTube channel that has been viewed over 10 million times and has been featured on Vice and BBC News. He started YouTube in 2014 and since has released 75 videos. His channel was originally named The Scope of Science, Der Raum für Wissenschaft in German, but it was renamed in 2018 to Curtis Baudy. This change also marked a shift in the channel's content. His earlier videos focused on biology, physics, and do-it-yourself experiments with a fun approach. During one experiment, he tried to live 24 hours without plastic, and in another one, he debunked conspiracy theories and proved the Earth was round with a spike and two sticks. The focus became environmental topics later, and in recent years, he has shifted his efforts entirely to the topics of climate change, change and climate justice. One outstanding experiment was sealing himself up in an airtight greenhouse with several hundred plants in order to demonstrate how we humans interact with the air we breathe. As an activist, he spent seven days occupying and living in a tree in the direct construction path of Trans Mountain Oil Pipeline in British Columbia, Canada. Today, he will be presenting on why the rich must pay for climate change. I am really pleased to welcome our today's guest, who I've been following for many years now, Curtis Baudy. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you again to, to Julia for, for doing this translation. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, as Micah said, I'm going to, Mika said, I'm going to be doing a, a talk on why the rich must pay for climate change. Um, talk is gonna go through two main phases. I'm going to talk firstly about who's responsible for climate change and like who is to blame and what that means and also about who is most and least affected by climate change and that whole section of the talk is going to be a little heavy uh, there's some some sort of uh, sad topics in there then i'm going to transition to the most important thing which is what do we do about it and how so that's the the format of my talk um, before I get started, oh, let's see, I need to make sure my screen is sharing. Um, yeah. Great. Um, so before I get started, I want to, if I can go to the next slide, there we go. I want to re respectfully acknowledge that in Canada, in British Columbia, where I am, I'm, I'm currently standing on the unceded traditional territory, effectively on, on stolen land from uh, the First Nations The, Co the Comox First Nations people. So uh, I know this isn't uh, something that you, you have in Germany, but uh, as a settler, it's important that I acknowledge that. Normally in a talk about climate justice, I would uh, talk extensively about this, though I've kind of tailored this talk to a German audience. So uh, I won't be, won't be getting into that in much more detail than this. Um, but I just want to acknowledge that it's important. Reconciliation is, is important. Okay. so. I used to think 
that climate change was a science problem. I did my master's of science studying renewable energy. I've, I've always cared about climate change and always cared about the environment. I like went vegetarian as a, as a young teenager and I'm vegan now and I'm 31. So I've always cared about this stuff. But I always thought it was, it was just about science. It was just about figuring out the right technologies that would solve the climate crisis. And while I was doing my master's, I realized that we actually have all of the technology that we need and we know enough about climate change to, to, to make the solutions and we, we know what we need to do. So I was pretty disheartened during my master's uh, because of that. And over time I realized, you know, what we really need is communication, right? People just need to understand that climate change is a really big deal and we need to understand that we need to take action on it. So after my master's, I started up this YouTube channel about general science communication. And I did all sorts of really bizarre over the top projects. Uh, and one of them, as, as was mentioned already, was to seal myself in a jar with several hundred plants. So this is a photo of that. And it's a small airtight greenhouse with about 300 plants. And I wanted to spend 24 hours in there in order to show how we interact with the air we breathe and how by breathing, we are putting out CO2 into the atmosphere. And that CO2 is causing climate change. It's, it's heating up our planet and it's causing all sorts of weird climatic events. And it's also affecting us directly. It affects our health. Um, so so I, I, I did this as a, as a presentation. I was just expecting it to be like any other video I'd worked on. Um, but two things happened that, that really surprised me. And one was that it went viral, uh, which I wasn't planning on live tweeting it, but it started trending on Twitter. And BBC News re reached out to me. And it, it became a big event in my life. And what that means is that I ended up spending months doing interview after interview, answering the same sorts of questions about climate change. And this was really the first time in my whole life that even though I'd been thinking about climate change for, for years, it was the first time that it really sunk in with me how big of a deal this was. Because you know, when you, when you repeat yourself enough times, you end up actually hearing and digesting what you were saying. And so this threw me into an existential crisis around climate change. And it also opened my eyes up to the fact that it's not just about a communic it's not just a communications problem. It's a, it's a climate justice or a social justice problem. So um, because, because this doesn't affect all people equally and it's, a, uh, it's not going to be solved unless we solve a bunch of other social and systemic issues. So I've spent the last few years figuring out how I can play a role in uh, climate justice and in uh, climate action. So this is a photo of me up in that tree canopy uh, in the path of that in the path of that pipeline. So that's that's a bit of my backstory in a, in a couple minutes. Um, Going to start by talking about who's to blame for climate change. One of the comments I get most often on YouTube is, you know, it, something about it being China's fault that climate change is happening, uh, and Usually it uses more uh, racist or xenophobic language than that. Unfortunately, I delete those comments, but, uh, but I get this sort of comment a lot. And Kurtz Gesagt, which is an excellent German educational YouTube channel, if you don't already know it, uh, they, did a, they did a wonderful video about this question. And I'm gonna use a couple images from, from that in the next couple slides. So, so who's, who's to blame for climate change? Yes. China does have a very large carbon footprint. And again, when we talk about climate change, as you probably know, the main thing that we mean is using fossil fuels that are underground and burning them into the atmosphere. And that carbon goes into the air. That's, that's what this whole issue is all about. And China has the largest carbon footprint for any country. They, have, uh, they, they emit 27% of all the carbon that's in the air. Uh, per year, the, the, all, the, all the carbon that gets added to the air per year. So that seems like, yeah, it, it, it might seem if you don't think about it in any more terms than that, that it's China's fault. But the thing that this sort of calculation doesn't show is that China has a very, very large population. There's about 1.39 billion, with a B, billion people uh, in China. And that's four times the population of the United States. So you would expect 
that if all other things were equal, there would be about a four times larger, um, like four times more emissions from China than the United States. But that's not the case. It's only, it's less than double. And, uh, and the same is true for the European Union. Um, they, they have a much smaller population, but proportionately it's, their, their, their footprint is large. So what we really need to be focusing on is per capita emissions, right? How much carbon is being put into the air per person. So using a German example, this is comparing Germany to India. In India, there is a bigger carbon footprint than all of Germany, but there is also more than a billion people. And I think relative to, to Germany, I'm not positive. You will know this better than I do, but uh, I think there's around 90 million people in, in Germany. So per person, their carbon footprint of, a, of the average German is about five times that of an Indian. This is important because when we ask who's to blame, what we really mean is who is going to have to solve things, right? Who is going to have to do the work to move forward? And it's a lot easier to cut your carbon footprint. It's a lot easier to, sh to shrink your impact on the environment if your impact is really big, right? If you eat meat regularly and you travel a lot around the world and you have a large home, et cetera, it's a lot easier to reduce your impact, to remove some of those uh, forms of consumption and to solve some of those than it is to, to shrink your carbon footprint if you're just trying to get by. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about in terms of comparing these, uh, these countries like this is that we can't just think about it per year because really climate change is, is about the last 200 years. It's about all of the time since the industrial revolution. And during that time, a full quarter, 25% of all of the carbon that people have added to the air has been added by Americans. And another 22% was added by uh, countries in the, in the EU. And that's really what this is about, right? This is, we have to take the long view. And if you use the long view, then, then China has had very little impact. And it's a country that's just now catching up. And that's what's important because We've had, we in the, in the global north have had all of this time to build our economies off of fossil fuels. And we can't expect that, and we've, we've benefited greatly from that despite climate change. And we can't expect that all other countries are just not going to have that option to have any way of, uh, of moving forward and developing without any help. So is this all just a bunch of finger pointing? You know, is this a useful framework? In some ways it is. Uh, I think in some ways it's important to be able to recognize uh, where these emissions are coming from. And again, who has, uh, who plays, who should play a role in, in coming up with the solutions. And on the other hand, I think it can be a bit of a bad way of thinking about it because um, it can be a little bit, missing the point, right? It's not a, it can be not a solutions oriented way of thinking. So along that line, I'm going to talk about the carbon footprint a bit, because I think it's something that at least in North America, we talk about and think about a lot. And I did a video about this a year ago where I actually analyzed every little detail in my carbon footprint, the carbon footprint being the carbon that I personally uh, emit through my lifestyle choices. So I looked at how I travel and how I get my groceries and the goods that I buy and everything that I do, my house, et cetera. I looked at all of that and I said, I calculated how much carbon it put into the air. And you know, I do fairly well. I do better than the average American or the average Canadian. Um, but what I realized in doing that was that if I were to do absolutely everything I possibly could, as long as I'm still buying food and, and living in Canada, there's emissions that I, I just can't get rid of, right? I still have to buy food from a grocery store. It's going to be grown by a farmer somewhere. They're probably using fossil fuels and it uses fossil fuels to get to me, right? So what I realized in, in doing this was that really individual action is not going to get us to where we need to be. We need to use uh, system level change. We need, we need government help. We need uh, policy changes. So 
That's one problem with the carbon footprint, but another, as I've kind of hinted to already, is that it fills us with a, a sense of guilt. It fills us with, uh, when, we, when we think about climate change, we think, oh, my carbon footprint is big. And instead of feeling empowered and encouraged to go out and solve and fight for, fight for climate action, we end up just feeling sad and bad about it. And, and that's not a productive feeling to have. Uh, I think it's normal to feel really sad about climate change, but feeling bad about your personal impact can hold you back um, from solutions. And that's not an accident because, and this is the biggest problem that I have with the idea of carbon footprints, um, it was popularized by an oil company. Uh, back in 2006, the company British Petroleum ran a huge ad campaign promoting the idea of the carbon footprint. And up until that point, it wasn't something that people knew about. It wasn't something that people thought about, but they ran this ad campaign and they promoted their online carbon footprint calculator where you could go and see how you were affecting the environment. They ran this in 2006 with the knowledge that it would probably dissuade people from finding systems-based solutions. It would get people thinking about, oh, what can I do you know, in my own little lifestyle instead of trying to get governments to regulate, uh, regulate the use of carbon, regulate the use of fossil fuels. So this wasn't an accident, it was a big uh, promotional campaign. And it's not the first time that these oil companies have done something like that. There's a wonderful book called Merchants of Doubt uh, by name Naomi Oreskes, which I recommend, covers this whole story about how Oil companies knew about climate change since the 1970s. They actually, the company ExxonMobil spent a million dollars retrofitting their largest super tanker with a massive climate research lab. And they collected a bunch of data about sea level rise and about uh, the earth's temperature. And they, they saw that, yeah, carbon was making the planet hotter and it was going to be really bad for humanity. And they knew all of this but by as early as the late 1980s, they started to create a misinformation campaign, basically telling people that, you know, the science isn't settled. The science is, is unsure. We, we, we should be in denial about climate change. And the image on the right here is an advertorial, which is an advertisement that looks like an editorial published by the New York Times in, in 2000. Basically, they were just trying to say, hey, we have this data that looks legitimate and you should trust us. The science on climate change is, is unsettled. So they knew about it and they lied. And this is important because we're going to be talking about accountability. And 100 companies are accountable for or responsible for 71% of all global emissions, right? So it's a small number of companies that have pr helped produce the vast majority of this problem and, and we, we got to keep them on the hook, so to speak. The other problem that I have with carbon footprints is that it's disproportionately the richest people in the world that are the most to blame. So this is a percentage of CO2 emissions across the entire world population. And as you can see the richest 10%, so just a tiny fraction of the people are responsible for about half of all global lifestyle emissions, right? So when we talk about carbon footprint, it's one thing to say to people, yeah, just eat less meat and travel less, but really the overwhelming majority of the work needs to be done by the richest 10% of people on the planet. And there are similar graphs for most countries. I know this is a global uh, distribution, but there's similar sorts of trends for Canada or for Germany. For the, a small number of Canadians or Germans are responsible for a large majority of, of the emissions. Which brings me to this image. Uh, it took time to make paper graphs of my carbon footprint compared with Paris Hilton's carbon footprint. Um, Paris Hilton, if you don't know, it's maybe a bit out of date, but she at least was a very famous rich person famous essentially for being rich. And this is an image of her in her half a million dollar Bentley, one of her eight luxury vehicles. And this is an image of her carbon footprint, uh, which is hundreds of times bigger than mine or than the average Chinese person or American person. 
And that is not including anything but her flights. That's just the emissions from her flights alone. And so what's wild to me is that we sort of idolize these people as a culture. We really, uh, we make TV shows about these people. We follow their Instagram accounts. And I think partly that's because we all want to have a life of luxury, but it, I think maybe it's also partly because we have a bit of Stockholm syndrome. We have a bit of a, you know, uh, we, we idolize these people because they, they, we think they're great and we think they're going to save everything. Um, and, and, and that's just not the case. Um, it's an image of Elon Musk as Iron Man. And I think a lot of people love Elon Musk and I'm, I'm going to disappoint some of those maybe right now. Um, but people think that billionaires like him will, will save the planet. And if, if they wanted to, you know, they could make a huge difference just by not being billionaires anymore, by effectively using their money to fight for climate action. Um, but they have other intentions, right? And they have less to worry about when it comes to carbon, when it comes to climate change. People like Elon Musk are going to be the least uh, affected by, by global climate disasters because he has, you know, he has multiple homes. He has sort of escape paths. And in fact, when climate change gets to its worst, there's a good chance that he won't even be on planet earth because he's built an entire, uh, an entire business in going, that's hoping to go to Mars. So that's a bit extreme, but at the same time, this is the sort of, uh, this is the sort of mindset of a lot of, a lot of the ultra rich. This is an image of an emergency apocalypse bunker that is somewhere in an un undisclosed location in America. And it has, you know, uh, an underground pool and a bowling alley and a shooting range. And it has all of these luxuries uh, and it only costs $1 million per suite, per person per suite. And uh, if you have enough money, you can, you too can, can be safe from, from climate apocalypse. Um, so this is, this is sort of the reality that we're in. We have, one group of people that are already struggling to get by. And we have, we have a, a super rich ultra billionaire class that, um, that can pay for their own safety. When we think about billionaires, it's hard to put it into terms that we can sort of visualize, but all of the billionaires in the world, just 2,153 individuals have more wealth than the poorest 58% of humanity. So you could fit a number of billionaires into a small volleyball arena. This is, this is the largest volleyball arena that there is. You could fit all of them in there uh, with room to spare and they would make up that amount of wealth, a staggering quantity of wealth, 8.6 trillion American dollars. And about 114 of them live in Germany. So gives you a bit of a sense. That's a, a disproportionate amount. There's a, a lot of very wealthy people living in Germany. Okay. But not everyone in Germany is super wealthy. Uh, about 10% of Germans own two thirds of the wealth in the country. So there's a huge disparity and that disparity is growing over time. Um, that's something that we see in a Basically, every country we look at, there's a statistic called the Gini, G-I-N-I index. And it basically looks at the gap between the wealthiest individuals and the people below the poverty line. And it's finding that over every country, aside from maybe like five or six of them, it's, it's been growing over the last 20 years. And that's increased dramatically during the last year, uh, during COVID. Okay. So... We talked about, about who's to blame for it. I'm going to shift gears a bit to talking about who will it affect. Um, this is a map, a heat map of where the Earth uh, will warm by NASA. Something we think about when we think four degrees temperature, four degrees Celsius of, of uh, warming or six degrees, whichever it is, that's an average. The fact is that temperature rise is not uniform. So certain places on the, in the world will warm more than others. The ocean is not going to warm as much as the land is. And also the temperature rise is not across, even across all, all seasons. 
it's really an extremifying of, of temperatures. So we're going to expect extremely hot summers and in some locations that will become lethal. There'll be more and more days in which it will just be deadly dangerous to, to be outside. And that's disproportionately going to affect countries that are closer to the equator. Sea level rise is also not uniform. Um, if we talk about uh, one meter of sea level rise or 10 centimeters of sea level rise, that is an average again. So countries again, closer to the equator where the centripetal force of the earth uh, is, is going, the sea level rise is going to be higher in some places. And it's already affecting people. This is not something that's far off in the future. This is something that has been happening already for at least a couple decades, and it's going to get a lot worse. So there's going to be, if, if we continue along the same trend that we are, there's going to be cities like Ho Chi Minh City and Bangkok that will be completely underwater. These are fairly low-lying cities. They have low elevation, and they're coastal, and they're near the equator. And with our current projections in the next 30 years, they're, they'll, they'll be completely wiped off of the map. And these cities, in, in, in a lot of cases, don't, don't have the infrastructure or the economy to, to build to prepare against that. They can't simply build a seawall to, to protect their cities and their nations. Um, and that's maybe no more clear than this example, which is the country of Tuvalu, which is an island nation in the South Pacific, a number of small islands with very low elevation. And they're projected to be completely underwater. Possibly it'll be the first country to, uh, to, for this to happen to, unless again, we take uh, a bold response. What's important here is that Tuvalu has had almost no carbon impact. They've contributed extraordinarily little to the climate crisis. Uh, the average person in the country makes $1,000 per year, 1,000 American dollars per year. So it's, it's a very poor country and this is not their fault. And yet they're taking the largest brunt of the impact. So all of this is talking about international climate disparity. So differences between countries, but we can see similar trends again, if we look within a country. And this is an example from, from the United States in New Orleans in 2005, there was Hurricane Katrina and it disproportionately affected black and people neighborhoods with people of color, poor neighborhoods. And that's not because the hurricane sought out those places, it's because those were disproportionately low lying areas in floodplains with infrastructure that was poorly maintained, right? There was not enough money invested to maintain the flood walls that broke. And there was also not as much uh, emergency response management and uh, solutions in those in those places. We can see now, uh, 16 years later, the majority of those people from those neighborhoods have not returned because the investments in fixing New Orleans largely went to the downtown tourist centers instead of to these, these neighborhoods. So, so this is still happening. There's a disparity within countries as well. Another last example is that American Blacks were three times more likely than whites to get COVID-19. There's no genetic reason for this. It's not a biological reason that COVID affects these people more. It's purely socioeconomic. It's purely that these people were more likely to be, uh, be living in places with more people, right? To have a house that had multiple families in them possibly and also that these people were more likely to be working on the front lines, right? These people had more exposure because they were working retail jobs or uh, working in the health industry. So, so th these are socioeconomic reasons. We could expect all of this, these sorts of trends to continue uh, until we do something about it. Okay, so that is all, it's a, it's a lot, I know. Um, I've thrown a bunch of heavy things at you. And I know this might sound cheesy, but I want to take, literally take every, you're, we're, we don't see you, so don't feel shy. Just take a deep breath in and a deep breath out and uh, sort of helps regulate our nervous systems a bit. 
Thinking about a lot of these issues can be really difficult mentally, like and emotionally, and it's easy to just get stuck in a, a sense of despair. I know I've been there. Um, and I think that there is a certain amount of grieving that we do need to do, but grieving alone is, is not going to, to solve it, right? So with that in mind, the rest of the talk, we're going to be solutions oriented. We're going to focus on what do we actually do about this? We need system change. What this all comes down to is we need to really change the infrastructure and the societal systems that we have in place across the planet. I'm gonna use one example, which is transportation. So in transportation, we need to do one thing, electrify everything. So our cars, for example, can no longer use internal combustion engines. They can no longer use gasoline. We need to switch them to be electric. But that's not enough because if all of our energy is getting generated by fossil fuels, then we haven't solved the problem. We've just sort of pushed it down the line. So we need to change all of our energy infrastructure to be renewable, be wind and solar and hydropower, for example, and possibly nuclear. That's a whole other thing. Um, but these are two of the main things we need to do for, for climate action. The third thing is the thing I've been talking about, um, which is that we need a just transition. We need to make sure that people working in car factories right now can be transitioned to a future economy where they're working in electric factories for electric cars. We need to make sure that people working in the oil and gas industry don't get left behind when we transition to making solar panel uh, fields and, uh, and windmills. So we need to help everyone transition. And that also applies for, for people, not just in these industries, but for people that are already suffering and people that are already um, struggling to get by. When we talk about um, when we talk about climate justice, I think the narrative used to be that people were, were worried that it would detract from the climate movement. People would say, oh, we have all of these other issues. You know, we already have to change our, our energy structures. We can't also worry about social justice, right? But the fact of the matter is that, that this is empowering, right? Telling people that we can build a better future for everyone together is something that encourages people to want to, to participate, right? It involves people in a way that is, that is very empowering. Excuse me. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, bonus, it's a benefit to, uh, to the climate movement. One of the ways in which we can do this is through some form of universal basic income or UBI for short. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what it is. It's basically what it says in the name, meaning it's universal. It will go to everyone, regardless of your age or your, uh, your working status or your health, everyone gets it. It's basic. So it covers your basic needs. It's enough money to cover your food and your housing. And it's an income. You get it and you get it every month, no matter what. So that's what it is. Would it work? Will it stop people from, from going about their normal lives and working and contributing to society? Wouldn't it be too expensive? There's lots of questions. I'm going to try to answer them very rapidly. Um, but there's a great book about this, about this and other things I'll be talking about which is titled Utopia for Realists by uh, Rudger Bregman. And uh, I recommend checking that out. I should say also, I'll be leaving a link to my slides at the end of, of this chat. So, so if you, you don't need to rush to write everything down. Um, one example of a study that was done to answer this question, does a, a UBI, does a universal basic income work? Uh, was done in the 1970s. So in Canada, in Manitoba, around 2,000 people received $16,000 annually, which is in Manitoba enough to pay rent and pay for food. It's not enough to live luxuriously, but, but you're, you're going to be okay. They did this study in the 1970s. And unfortunately, what happened was towards the end of that study, uh, the government shifted power, a conservative government came into, into power and they canceled the experiment. And what's wild about this experiment is that all of the data didn't get analyzed. It sat in, uh, in storage cabinets for decades 
until 2011, when someone finally, a researcher from a university actually went and, and dug it up and did, did an analysis. And what she found was that, in fact, people didn't work less. There were a few exceptions. Most people just went about their, their daily lives and enjoyed a little bit more luxury. They were able to do a little bit more than, than the things they would previously, with a couple exceptions. Um, young mothers, for example, spent more time at home helping their kids grow up, which is probably beneficial to society as a whole in the long run. And also people went back to school and completed high school. So there were some people that, that worked less in order to become more educated, which is also beneficial to our culture, to our society in the long run. Surprisingly, they found that hospital visits also dropped 8.5%. So just giving people a little bit of money each year helped them to be more healthy, but also pre prevented people from getting into alcohol-related accidents because alcohol consumption dropped off. People basically felt, you know, there was more to live for and they had uh, more options in front of them. So that dropped off and so did mental health visits to the hospital. So in general, uh, this is a, a this... <laughs> 30 years later, we found out that this worked really well uh, for what it was intended to do. Um, but MinCum is just one study. Over, since then, there's been many that have found many similar sorts of results. And we've seen a lot of similar studies uh, sort of accidentally or unplanned happening due to COVID-19 from governments giving people funds to pay the rent and pay for food. Um, so because of that, the idea of the universal basic income is gaining traction again. It's something that people are starting to talk about again. And it turns out that it's even an effective way to run for a political position. We've seen people in the UK, for example, that are primarily running on a platform of, I'm going to push for a UBI and they're getting elected. We also see, uh, I forget which German state this is in, but there is a, study that started in 2020 in Germany, where they were giving uh, people funds just to pay for, uh, pay for things. And I think it was, yeah, it's a study of 120 people where they get uh, $1,400, I think that's American, a month for three years. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of years from this, but uh, I imagine it will be similar to the trends we've seen from other countries. So this is exciting. I think that it's a, a, an exciting revitalization of this. Um, how will we pay for these sorts of things? They seem very expensive. Um, one of the ways in which we can raise a lot of money to help fight for uh, and pay for climate justice is by just raising taxes for the rich. I've talked about this wealth disparity. We can, we can simply raise their income tax, so money that they get each year, that they, that they earn each year, we can raise the tax rates for those. We can also put a tax on wealth. So for example, in Canada, if we said, if we looked at just the people that earned already 20 million, or sorry, that own $20 million, if we tax that wealth that's above that, if we tax it at a rate of 1% per year, Canadians would get an additional $10 billion in revenue a year, right? And that's just money that is just sitting in these people's bank accounts, right? It's not contributing to society, but we could make it contribute to society. We could also, and this is a more extreme idea that is starting, that people are starting to, to talk about, we could put a cap on wealth. We could effectively say, okay, anyone that has over a billion dollars, you can keep $1 billion, but the rest of that is going to get seized by the government. The rest of that is going to go to help all of the other 99.99% of people in the country. So it's a bold idea, but it's something that's starting to catch on. This is a photo of uh, Alexandria, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez with a shirt that uh, you can buy on her website. She's a member of Congress and uh, yeah, it's tax the rich. It's an idea that people are starting to talk about again. And it's important because as we've mentioned with talking about people's carbon footprints, the planet can't sustain a billionaire class, right? These people, they fly in their private jets and they have multiple mansions and multiple vehicles and they 
our, our planet can't live with this class of people on it. So taxing them can do two things. It can reduce their carbon footprints, right? It can reduce the environmental impact of these people and it can help the rest of the 99% of people on the planet, right? So it's twofold. But it's not just about going and focusing on individuals. We also need to hold corporations accountable. So corporations like ExxonMobil, which knew about and lied about climate change for decades, we need to hold these companies accountable for the, the emissions and their contributions, uh, their, their contributions against the climate, I would say. So, and this is happening. We found just in the last week that a court ordered, a court in the, the Netherlands ordered the company Royal Dutch Shell to cut its carbon emissions by 45% by 2030, which is a huge landslide, uh, landslide deal. Uh, very exciting because if this is replicated in other countries, then we can really hold these countries, really hold these companies accountable. We can also go after these companies when they make mistakes. For example, there was a big case in Ecuador uh, where this, the, company, um, the company Chevron basically spilled a, a many millions of tons of oil into the Ecuadorian water supply. And there was a lawsuit that was settled for $18 billion. So Chevron had to pay $18 billion uh, to basically help repair the situation. And this is a specific example about a spill, but we can, we can create similar lawsuits for climate and for emissions. Uh, and I think that that's something we should be looking forward to. Okay, but it's not just about money, right? It's not just about um, the cost. It's also, um, we're, we're also at a very interesting and I would say worrisome time in our culture. We're at a bit of a crossroads right now. In the global north, in countries like, um, like mine, we're seeing a, and in Germany, we're seeing a rise in sort of polarization between the political ideological left and the politi political ideological right. We're seeing basically an extremifying situation where conservative governments are becoming more and more conservative and more and more basically fascist. And that is one sort of response to climate disaster, right? These are people that are afraid of climate migrants coming in to their countries, right? There's, there's the racist ideologies that we need to keep these people out. And because of that, we are witnessing the age, a new age of wall building. I know Germany has a long history of uh, of dealing with this, but, but this is happening again. So in America, they're trying to build walls between Mexico and, and the United States. And in the UK, they've successfully, well, semi-successfully uh, removed themselves from the European Union. And these are people that were elected primarily to go about doing this, right? They're elected on, elected on the promise that they would achieve these things. So this is, very concerning in part because it's just not effective. It's not something that works. Um, the American border wall between Mexico and, and, and the United States started really in the 1960s. And the idea was that all of the Mexican migrants that were coming over for seasonal work, um, their people were worried that they would stay and that they would become illegal immigrants. So they worked on, on this border wall. And what they found was that actually by making it harder for these people to come into the country and do their seasonal work and go home, because it was harder to, to cross that barrier, people just came once and once they got there through whatever means, but they stayed. And so illegal immigration has actually increased because of this wall. Often a lot of times walls are built to keep people out, but they actually keep people in um, and they can, they can have unintended consequences. So walls don't work. There's a great video about this by the Gravel Institute on YouTube, which I could recommend. But more importantly, um, it's not the moral thing to do. When we had the Syrian refugee crisis, as you know, uh, Angela Merkel said, wir schaffen das, right? We can do it, we can do this and open the border for Germany to 
uh, Syrian refugees to, a, a, I think it was a million Syrian refugees. And this is something that's going to be way more important as we move forward and as the climate continues to break down. Um, and I, I say that not being a pessimist, I say that because even if we stop the missions today, there is going to be a continuing rise as a, it, it takes longer for these, the carbon that's already in the atmosphere will continue to warm things. It will get worse um, I mean, and we need to prepare for that. But we can help these countries, right? We can open our borders and let people in and we can provide international support to nations and people in need during climate breakdown, right? So climate reparations is, is one way that we can sort of hold ourselves in the global North accountable. And so that we can share our, um, we, we benefited from, from fossil fuels for, for centuries and we can sort of share that growth while keeping people, um, while keeping people moving in a direction that is away from fossil fuels. And one way we can do that is open borders. We can also help countries to develop green economies and basically prepare for climate disasters, right? So trend company or countries that are now transitioning from um, poor undeveloped places that are building infrastructure now to be, you know, to live the lives of, 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 uh, of more, live more luxurious and healthy, safe lives as they should, as they have a right to. These people, we got to help them transition in ways that don't increase their fossil fuel use. Right? When we talk about climate justice, we need it, it, the just. What, the just in that is that these people have access to a livable climate and a livable place, and they should have the same sorts of luxuries that we have. Um, but we need to help them make that in a smooth, uh, safe way, make that transition in a smooth, safe way. We also need to be electing leaders that are fighting for these, these sort of climate justice principles. And right now, unfortunately, the majority of the labor leaders in the global north are, are, are the elite. <laughs> We're electing people that don't really represent and don't really seem like the, re the majority of people in the country. So in Trude Trudeau, Merkel, Joe Biden, all of them are worth over $9 million, right? These are some of the wealthiest people in the country. And again, they are the class that is going to be least affected by climate change. And they're the most, frankly, out of touch with the situation. And if we really, and, not, and this isn't to say that there are no wealthy people, there are some wealthy people that are fighting, uh, legitimately fighting for, for climate justice, but based on the actions from, at least from Trudeau, I can speak specifically, uh, these, these people aren't making it a priority. But we can elect people that are. So we can elect working class socialists or eco-socialists or social democrats. There's all sorts of terms for this. But we can elect people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who used to be a waitress before she was elected uh, to, to Congress. She has a, you know, a net worth of $30,000. She's, uh, she's not a multimillionaire but she campaigned on the idea that she would help strengthen communities through structural changes. She campaigned not on saying, I'm going to do one or two tweaks, one or two small changes, but she had a bold vision for how she would help lift up and elevate all of the working class people in the country. We need to help more people like her get elected. And we can do that by voting for them, but we can also do that by helping them, like directly. We can volunteer for them. Uh, super important, in part because they need help, but they also need more help than, uh, than wealthier people that are campaigning. And I know that this is less the case in Germany, but uh, it costs a lot of money to... There, I know, I think in Germany, there's a cap on how much you can spend in... Uh, in an election race, in a campaign. But still, it's, it's harder for, for people that don't have as much social capital to get the attention that they need in order to get as many votes as they need to pass uh, and to become elected. So if you can volunteer some time with, for these sorts of people, that would be incredible. If there aren't uh, candidates that you feel like you should volunteer for and that you feel like are really pushing climate justice ideas, you can run. 
right? You can actually go and become a politician and you can do this. Um, I think that we need to see more, especially young people going about this, if we're going to, to have these solutions. I know that a lot of you are also already um, thinking about protests and have probably been involved in protests. Um, one th there's two things I wanna say in terms of the climate justice aspect of protest, which is that we have to think about our multiple layers of privilege, right? So myself, you know, I'm a, I'm a fairly wealthy white man and I have a lot of layers of privilege. So I spent a week up in the tree canopy in the path of an oil pipeline and a tiny tent, which you can see in this image, that's the entire tent. Um, but I could do that because I knew, you know, I, I could spend a week not, not working. I could spend a week off of work and uh, I wouldn't lose my job over it. And I could, uh, I, could, I could afford to do that. That's a privilege, right? I could also afford to risk getting arrested which is not something that a lot of people have as an option. A lot of people would risk losing their jobs over that. And I'm also wasn't as worried about uh, issues like police brutality as are many people of color uh, because there's you know, systemic racism in our policing industry. So we, when we think about protests, we need to think what privileges do I have and how can I contribute to them? Um, to, to, how can I contribute, use them to, to contribute? We also need to think, how can I fight for climate justice in a way that involves other people, right? We need to be reaching out to Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and reaching out to these minority groups and, and helping raise their voices uh, and help them be heard. All of this sounds like a lot. I know it sounds pretty difficult to achieve these sorts of, this scale of changes, um, which is why I want to bring up in, in basically in closing the 3.5% 3, 3 rule. And it's a rule in quotations because it's not a law of physics, but what it is, is that uh, Erica Chenoweth, this person did her PhD studying civil resistance movements. So she looked at big scale changes in government and the movements that help make them possible. And she found that for any time in all of history, in any of these movements, any time it reached a threshold of 3.5% of the population, once that amount of the population in the area committed to action, committed to changing it, spent their time helping uh, nonviolently resisting, whenever it reached that threshold, they succeeded. So it makes a strong argument that all we need in order to get climate justice is 3.5% of the population that's fighting actively for it, nonviolently fighting for it. If we can achieve that, then, then, we, then we can do this. That's what, that's what her research suggests, which is exciting because that's, that's not very many people. That's, that's something we can do. But to get there, and this is what I'm going to close on, uh, we need to talk more about climate change. I know a lot of you are already thinking about it more than most people, um, but to sort of drive that home for Americans, about two thirds of Americans rarely or never talk about climate change with their friends and family. So most people, I know the number is slightly higher in Germany, but only slightly. Um, and it's again, not on the news. Climate change got about four hours of coverage in, in American news in 2019 total for the whole year. So. People aren't talking about it and we need to fix that. That's up to us. And the message that we need to get across is, is simple. This is a crisis that's real and it's urgent, but via Schaff and us, like we can do this. You know, this is something that we can, we can, we can fix. And in doing so, it will be beneficial to everyone, right? 99.9% .9 of people are going to benefit greatly from these sorts of climate justice reforms. And the remaining 0.1% they're going to be fine, right? They're only going to be, um, it's, they're not going to be very affected. Um, so this is what we need to do. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks again to, to Julia for translating this. And I'm excited to, to take, take questions and have a discussion. Um, yeah. I'll stop sharing. I'll share my slides as well in the chat.
Okay, thank you, Curtis. That was really interesting. It uh, summed up some uh, of the points you already had in the lecture series. And um, now we also have, I have collected some questions for you. Awesome. Okay, the first question was from Kurt, and I think it's a rhetoric question, but maybe you want to answer it anyway. Uh, sure. When you talked about China, Kurt said, mm -hmm. but who are the consumers of Chinese products? I absolutely forgot to say this. Uh, <laughs> I meant to say, yeah, the, the majority. So we, when we talk about, yeah, this is kind of rhetorical. So much of China's industry is in creating products for the rest of the world, specifically, especially the global north. And their carbon footprint does not account for that, right? Those are technically my emissions and your emissions, the products that don't get consumed in China. Um, so it's absolutely ridiculous that, that we should put the blame on them for that because uh, it's that's on us right yeah good point i'm glad someone pointed that out because i yeah meant to say that thank you okay so there is another question from yalda moradi she asked about um about the electricity so how comes so much electricity how should we how should be those huge amount of electricity manufactured so I guess it's about how to produce the energy that we need in order to, to do the transition to electric. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so there's two folds. There's two ways that we need to approach this. One, we do need to transition everything to, to electric, right? We need to create way more electric energy. We also need to cut our consumption, right? So we think about it this in terms of, oh, the global demand for energy is increasing. And that's our target, but really our target is to drastically first reduce our consumption. There's a lot of waste and a lot of inefficiencies, especially in countries like mine, and, and we, can, we can reduce that. But also it's achievable. Uh, there's a, uh, the biggest sort of um, study on this is called Project Drawdown. And uh, I think their website is projectdrawdown.org, but I'll just write that down. Here. And they, they basically went about saying, okay, this is the amount of carbon that we need to uh, we need to reduce our consumption by, and this is the amount of energy we need to make, and how can we do that? And they basically said, okay, we need exactly this many windmills, we need exactly this many solar panels, we need this much uh, nuclear power, and so on. And the math works out. Like these, this is technology that we have. It's things we can do. Um, it seems like a lot, but you know, it's. It will, and it will be expensive, but the alternative is uh, that we don't have an economy in, uh, in 80 years. So like there's, there's no real other option. Okay, so there was a follow-up question to this by Florencia. <clears throat> so what do you think about drastical changes like ecological and social impact on, on, of electrifying everything, like about the cobalt and lithium mining and... Um, And you also ask about the salary and the contamination of water and neurotoxins. And yeah, so what do you think about the downside of electrifying everything? Yeah, so batteries are, are very bad for the environment right now. Uh, we don't even currently have good ways of recycling them. Um, and we can't just expect that we can go, again, go about consumption as usual and just switch it to electric and everything will be fine. Um, My car example is not, I, I use the example of, of changing to electric cars, and that's not perfect because a lot of what we need to do is increase efficiencies in how we do transportation. So for example, instead of just doing everything like normal, but getting electric cars, we need to increase our public transportation systems and we need to do more in the future working from home so that people don't commute as much. We need to, to think about this in a systems uh, mentality. Because yeah, tra changing everything to electric will in many ways be bad for the environment. Um, so we need to do that mindfully. We also can, can look for technologies that, that are less harsh on the environment. So I know there's a company in, uh, in Canada, it's in Quebec and it is called uh, Nouveau Monde. It's a French term, Nouveau Monde. And they're a mining company that mines for, um, one of the battery metals, I forget which, but their entire mine is 
ethically sourced, right? They've done consultation with the First Nations there and they're entirely electric. Their mine is electric. So they have no uh, machinery that uses fossil fuels. So, so there's like, there's ways to do this that are more sound for the environment. And we just need to, to make sure we're, we're holding those companies to that, to those, those standards. But yeah, we can't just go about this blindly. That's a very good point. So then um, I have two questions for you. Personal questions, oh, more or less personal. Um, sure, yeah. I mean, who's who's supposed, like, in your, your from your own point of view, who's supposed to make the change? Is it us, the consumer, or the voter, or is it the government or corporations? The the unfortunate and maybe dissatisfying answer that I have to give is that it's all of those things. Um, there is no one silver bullet to this. I think for too long we have been focused on consumer changes, and that hasn't worked for the last, well, for my whole lifetime, for the last 30 years, the changes that we need are going to need to be like government prescribed. We're going to have to have regulations for this to, to happen. Um, I think that holding corporations accountable is extremely important, but I think it's unlikely to happen just by voting with our dollar. I think we need to pressure governments to regulate these, these corporations and also just to break some of these mega corporations up We have conglomerates that, you know, they basically own all of the industry. They have a monopoly and they can do whatever they want because they have no competition. And we need to use our antitrust acts to, to, to break these corporations up. And I think that that will help in a lot of ways for these environmental issues as well. Um, but yeah, we, we need to do sort of all, all the things at once, which is kind of overwhelming, but that's how it is. Yeah, so a few weeks ago, we had um, an economist from Germany who said at the moment, it's impossible for the German government to introduce like stricter laws, like for example, to like introduce a stricter limit for the autobahn, for the highway, because he said it's not acceptable. Like at the moment, the majority of the people would reject this law. So he suggested like a bottom up approach to um, first, we have to change The, the mindset of the people, and then the politic can change the system. What do you think about that? I would respectfully disagree with that. <laughs> um, I think that when there's times of emergency, we can do bold, bold things. Uh, I think two years ago, if you said, okay, we're going to make it illegal for Americans to do certain activities in their own homes with other, with their friends and family, You know, we're going to prevent them from getting together in groups. That would have seemed outrageous, right? That would have seemed like that will never happen in a thousand years. Americans love their freedoms and you cannot take them away. And we've seen with COVID that actually the vast majority of Americans accepted that because they realized that this is an emergency and they need to take bold action. And it's them playing their part, right? There is an act of patriotism there as well. And I think that's a, the same is true for climate change, right? If it's framed correctly and if it's communicated well, we can make these bold and large scale shifts in policy, but, but, but they need to be communicated. Yeah, so I think it's possible. I don't know which specific Autobahn regulation this is for, but I think these, these things are possible. Okay, so we have one more question from YouTube. Um, can you talk shortly about electric waste, especially of public institutions? I am seeing loads of this um, that should be avoidable. So is there um, a success story to orient own activism on? Yeah, uh, so e-waste is, or electrical, electrical waste is a huge problem and uh, very little is being done about it right now. When we think about recycling, we think usually plastics, um, sometimes paper or metals and glass. Most of those things aside from plastics are fairly easy to recycle, even if we're doing a poor job of it. But with e-waste, there's very little, um, there's very little technology and very little sorts of systems in place to help this happen. What's largely happening is that these materials are getting shipped to poorer countries and people are smelting them in their backyards and inhaling toxic metal fumes. It's a huge issue. 
but there are ways we can do it. Um, we can, I know one example from Vancouver where, where I lived for the last several years is there was a, a not-for-profit company that basically started accepting old computers and old electronic waste and they would get volunteers to help repair them because in most cases, you know, it's my phone screen broke and all I need is a new screen and the phone is fine. So they would repair them and then they would sell them in the shop um, on site and the money would go to help them run their business. It wasn't a profitable business, but they, they made it work. So we can do things like that. Um, you can see if there's something local like, like that that you can, you can help out with, or you can try to start one if you can get some people together. And I know, and I don't know any of the names of them offhand, but I know there's organizations that are helping to make it safer for people in uh, developing world countries that are already doing this, that are you know providing them with respirators and helping them know that they can work with certain materials in some ways and, uh, and develop some sorts of standards so that it's safer for these individuals that are doing it. But ultimately, Again, I think it's going to come down to regulating this. We need to make sure that, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in, in something like a, a dead smartphone. There's so much gold and nickel and copper. There's, there's valuable metals in here. And uh, we, we need to make sure that governments are, are basically managing that and getting the money back out of it. <laughs> okay, so there's one more question by Svantia. The rich people have impact, have more impact on political system because they have a lobby. And uh, how is it possible by voting for politicians who are influenced by the lobby, lobby after the election to make the rich pay? So um, it's accountability in governments is really hard. I think that's an issue we've had since democracies started. Um, but there are some things that we can do, especially in places where we get to vote for the same politician. We have the chance to vote for them again. Um, one thing I know is, is common in, this, in, in America is that there is basically this organization, and I forget its name, that funds different campaigns for politicians. And as a politician, you can basically refuse that donation. <laughs> It makes it harder, but you can say, I'm going to run a campaign that is free of donations from corporations, and I will not accept money from, from corporations. And that's like, that's pretty straightforward. It just takes some transparency and a commitment to that. Um, but you can find politicians that are doing that. And uh, yeah, and then you can at least expect that their influence is going to be lessened by that. And then moving forward, you know, After one election, you can check back in. How did they do? Did they, you know, did, did they accept this uh, moving forward? And, and yeah, you can kind of do that. But that's tough. That's a hard problem. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question from YouTube by Hannes Jacobi. And he says, since you're promoting voting to achieve socialist reform, what makes you believe in reform rather than revolution? I mean, I think that we need both possible paths, right? I don't know what exactly will work. I think we need protesting and I think we need um, political action as well. Um, I think the important thing when we talk about revolutions is again, the research shows um, more, like morals aside, I mean, I'm a nonviolent person to my core but the research shows that it's nonviolent uh, protests that, that are effective. Um, And only like nonviolent revolutions have, have really managed to succeed. Um, but yeah, I'm not I'm not betting on any horse, so to speak. I don't know which which will be the path forward. I think if things get bad enough, if we leave this situation for long enough, then I think the only path will be uh, a full scale revolution. But I really hope it doesn't come to that. Okay, so we have a long question from Kurt. What do you tell those people? who are going on consuming the products of the capital, which they are charged of climate sins, using Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Google, watching YouTube for entertainment, feeding discount branches, buying every year a new smartphone, new computers, while their old ones still are working, driving around by car instead of cycling and so on. Would you agree that we uh, can let the rich pay by denying to buy the products of their industry? Well, there's a lot there. Um, 
I mean, this is effectively like, what do we do about, and my, my interpretation of this is effectively like, what do we do about capitalism as a culture? Uh, and I think that that's something that we can't just undo overnight. I think that there's a lot of people, I think the majority, in some cases, the majority of people have really bought into this ideology that buying things will make them happy. Uh, and that's not the case. Like people, when they use Facebook longer, they are more likely to get depressed. And, you know, when they have bigger homes, they tend to be more isolated from their neighbors. And again, they can are more likely to be depressed and so on. We see, we see these trends. How do we fix that? I, I, I don't know. I think it's a, something that we have to use as use ongoing conversation for. Um, would I, would I agree that we can let the rich pay by denying to buy their products of their industry? Um, I think that that's part of the solution. Like I think we can boycott certain industries, um, but I think that doing a boycott on the level of an individual isn't that effective. I have a video about this, about trying to boycott Amazon. Amazon owns so many companies, right? Boycotting Amazon doesn't just mean boycotting their website. It means boycotting, um, there's a whole grocery store chain. There is Audible Books. There is um, several other, I think, uh, several other book companies. They own you know, Amazon Ring that manages your house and they own all of these things. They also own, I think like two thirds of the web is hosted by Amazon servers. So you can't just boycott them as an individual, but we can boycott them as a collective, right? So if we get organized and we say, we're gonna boycott Amazon for the month of May or whichever, you know, and we make it a movement then we can have success with that, I think. Okay, so there's one more question by Isa. Why do you propose a tax on income rather than a maximum income, like um, to minimum income? Yeah, no, I, I think that, there's a number of ways of doing this. Um, I'm happy with either. <laughs> I think that I think that it's going to vary from country to country as to what is ultimately possible and acceptable. It will depend a lot on like the precedent that's been placed. Um, I think that a maximum income makes sense. I also think that frankly, a wealth on capital makes a lot of sense. Having a sorry, a cap on wealth makes a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, I, th I think. To me, I'm not a details-oriented person, um, and I, th I think that I, th I think that all of these sorts of solutions of basically just taxing the rich in various ways have promise. <laughs> but I'm not an economist, so. Okay, so so far there is only one one personal last question by me left. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and uh, how do you? Because before when we were talking, I had the feeling that you have a really positive mindset and you talked about this during your lecture as well. So I'm curious, how do you keep your positive mindset? You know, I, I think outwardly I have a more positive mindset than I sometimes do uh, like by myself. I think that uh, there are definitely times, I don't mean to give the impression is what I mean to say. I don't mean to give the impression that I'm always happy, go lucky, but uh, there are definitely times when I, when I feel in a bit of climate despair and I think that that's okay to feel sometimes you know these are heavy topics and we we don't need to just hide in happiness the whole time we can face this um, but ultimately the thing that keeps me really moving is that I know no matter how things go with the climate I just want to know that I did my best right I want to feel good about the fact that I tried and I did everything that I could Because ultimately, you know, regardless of how, how it pans out, um, it's just the right thing to do. It's, 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 it's the ethical way forward. And so I will keep fighting my hardest no matter what. And I, I think that that's really the only way you can move forward when it comes to big crises like this. And there's promise. There are, there are positive things to look forward to. I think that the idea of climate justice is exciting. I think that we have the chance to basically re like rebuild our society in a way that is equitable. Um, and it's probably the biggest opportunity we'll ever have in all of history for this. So that's exhilarating, frankly. Okay, I guess that was a nice way of ending the session. I mean, Wonderful. there are no, no more questions. So um, 
I guess uh, thank you all for stepping by. Uh, thanks, Curtis, for joining us today. Oh, there's one more by Florencia. Uh, I only want to say that it, this is important and a responsibility for us to inform us about the mining problems. Okay, yeah, thank you. For sure. Yeah, um, yeah, and thank you so much to everyone for being here. It's uh, you know not not always easy to just hop on another Zoom call, and I really appreciate all of your time and all of the work that you're doing. So thank you again. And thanks again to Julia for translating all of my ramblings. <laughs> yeah, so next week we will have another lecture by Dr. Michael Zander on inclusion and capitalism. And uh, yeah, if you, want to, if you want to come, just show up on, um, if you want to join Students of Future, you can come on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And uh, yeah, hopefully to see you uh, next week.